please join me in welcoming the Honorable Donna Dukes. Want to come upstairs over there? Thank you for being here. Happy to have you here. Thank you. I'll put you over there. Good morning. Good morning. Appreciate you making the effort to be here. I apologize. I believe that everyone's been, been told. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, it, it, I'm sure it just makes you want to get back into the legislature and fix the transportation problems on I-35, right? <laughs> Right? You just don't know. Your agenda. So, Representative Dukes, I want to begin by, by talking about why we're here. Um, as you know, and I want to be sure the audience knows, we've been in conversation for about six months about this. I've reached out to you during the last six months and said, look, I, I know that you have some concerns about the way your story is being told and about the limits that you have on your own ability to tell your story. And when the opportunity presents itself, I'd love to be able to sit down in public and talk. And you were very kind in acknowledging my request and in indulging me a couple different times when I tried to get you to go around your lawyers and you wouldn't do it. But finally, when the charges would drop, we had this conversation. I have been asked uh, in the last couple of weeks, why are you doing this? And the reason is, as I said to you six months ago, I think it's important for everybody to have an opportunity to tell their story. And I know that you have a concern about the way that the story has been told. I do. I also believe that people have been asking you, why on earth are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Why did you agree to be interviewed finally? Why did I agree to be yeah. interviewed? Yeah. Oh, because it's an opportunity to tell the real story. Right. It's an opportunity to uh, present the truth as the facts are and not as they were twisted and continue to be altered to give a certain perception. Right. I wanted the opportunity to speak yeah. because I've been under a gag order since September of 2016 by, um, it was an unofficial order, right. uh, but by the DA not to speak about my health, the case, or anything, which gave them ample opportunity to hammer me in the newspaper where I couldn't respond. And it was one-sided. Completely. Right. So, so this is an opportunity for us to get to uh, some kind of a common uh, uh, agreement on what the facts are. And I want to begin th there, because we live in a world today where different people see facts in different ways. There are different sets of facts as opposed to one common under, a commonly understood set of facts. So I would like to go through the sequence of events just to be sure that as we understand what transpired, the facts that are the context for our conversation, that you also agree that those are the facts. So I go back to February 2016 when it was first reported that the state auditor's office was investigating you and in April, the Texas Rangers joined the investigation. Those two things, from a time standpoint, are as you understand them to be as well. Sta first the state auditor and then the Texas Rangers. No, what happened in February, or actually in January of 2016, I terminated an employee on his 89th day, because um, he wasn't going to make it through the probationary period. Right. He went and collected all of this story um, actually, part of it he did on the state dollar. He started about a month prior to his termination, right. shopped it to different media outlets. Once he was terminated, he was planning on doing the press conference on that day, January the 14th, right. but no one else would go in with him. But he shopped it, and the first uh, entity to pick it up was the Tribune, right. and started running with the story about the African American Community Heritage Festival, and then it was presented as if it was a misuse of employees uh, when all one had to do, and I told the reporters this constantly, look at the statute. The Texas legislature had passed a law for Buddy West, who was working and raising funds for Big Brothers Big Sisters, and it said that a legislator could work with a nonprofit, could raise money for a nonprofit, staff could raise money for a nonprofit, right. and the other part was that it was a community event at Houston Tillerson in the community, working with a nonprofit in the community and free to the public. But the audit was presented the, yeah. as being something illegal, and that's not true. Well, in fact, I believe the, the Tribune story in February simply said that the state auditor was looking into this allegation. The no. state auditor did look into the allegation, correct? No. The Tribune started with the festival. Right, they were looking Terry into the allegation about into, they were looking into the allegation about the festival. The festival, and right. then started um, speaking to people and raising allegations that the monies that were raised for the festival mm -hmm. were not given to Houston Tillerson University. 
over a quarter million dollars. I was being accused of keeping that money, and that wasn't true. So when it comes to September of that year, so again, it, it's reported, and I understand you have an issue with this, it's reported that the state auditor and the Texas Rangers are both looking into matters, this matter and matters related. You make a decision in September uh, that you're not going to, uh, you're going to resign, that you're not going to, uh, to, to continue to serve on behalf of your district. It's too late for your name to be removed from the ballot. You make the decision that you're going to run for election and then uh, resign at midnight on the day that the session is going to gavel in rather than taking the oath, correct? You made that decision. And that was uh, uh, in response to an offer to do so by the previous district attorney, Rosemary Lemberg. No. No. That wasn't why I made that decision. Okay, why did you do it? <laughs> That's what's presented on and on again. And I heard one of the ADAs get on the stand uh, during one of the hearings and present that. Okay. Uh, it was very bothersome. So what actually happened, uh, Representative? What actually happened, August 31st, somewhere around the first part of uh, September, I had a medical situation. And I went to the ER and I had some tests run. Um, then I had additional tests run days later my doctor called me and wanted me in her office right away. And when I got there and saw the report, based on her knowledge, she, a specialist needed to do further review, right. uh, but based on her knowledge, um, the outcome of my life looked very dim. And with everything else going on, I just said, to hell with it. I'm going right. to spend time with my family. So, so, so any connection that has been made in the press or that others have assumed or made between your decision in September to, to, to announce that you were not going to continue to serve as it related specifically to this investigation, no connection whatsoever. It was entirely about health. All you have to do is read the words. Right. It said, I do not feel I can serve to the level, which is a level that's been very high. Right that I have given in the past. Here's the quote. This has been a very difficult, this is September 26th of 2016. This has been a very difficult decision to make. However, in light of my ongoing health issues and concerns, I find that I can no longer provide the active, effective leadership that's needed to continue my sworn duties. I must take time to focus all of my energy to heal and continue to provide for my young daughter and extended family. That's the exact quote. That's the quote. And so that, and just take it as it is. Take it as it is. So then we get ahead to January. You've been reelected. No, yeah. We didn't get ahead to January. Okay. A week and a, about a week, week and a half later, I wrote a post on Facebook to my constituents, uh, thanking them for all of the support they've given me over the years and during the time of my sickness, and asking for continued privacy because I was still processing. My yes. family was still processing. Yes. The morning after, the day after, around four o'clock. My attorneys received a call from the DA who said that they read a post or told about a post that said that I had rescinded the statement that I would retire. It said no such thing. This is back in September. This was in October. October, okay. October, early September, I mean early October or late September. And um, I remember because uh, Debbie Delco, was staying with me at that time to help me because I was sick and she just brought me home from the doctor. And the attorneys called and they were just screaming about this Facebook post that they hadn't even read, terrified I guess of the DA, and that if I did not waive my statute of limitation within the next 15 minutes that Greg Cox threatened to indict me the following Monday and the attorneys would quit. And I could not talk on Facebook anymore. Yep. That happened before all of this. Then time went on, and there were some things uh, that made me change my mind. Right, so January 7th, three days before the day that you were to have resigned, three days before the legislative session was going to gavel in, you announced, in fact, I'm not going to follow through on the plan that I uh, had. had, had I, no, I say I'm not going to follow through. I said, I'm going to take the oath of office, as I had said when I put my name uh, on the affidavit to run for office. Right, but had you not said, Representative, that your intention had been to resign on midnight of that day and not actually take the oath of office? 
Yes, because I said I could not serve to the level I'd served in the Right, past. so in fact, the January 7th decision to take the oath of office was a change of what you had said you would do. This is not a judge, I'm not, I'm not, it's not a qualitative judgment, I'm just simply saying as a matter of fact, you said you were not gonna take the oath, but then you made a decision to take the oath. I decided to keep my word and take Right, the so in the, in, the, and in the interim, and we'll come back to this, a bunch of people who took you initially at your word that you were not gonna run decided to get in the race, so then that gets complicated on that side. So then January 10th, you take the oath and then you serve. On January 18th, the DA's office announces uh, the indictments. 13 counts of tampering with a public record. This relates to what they say formally false entries under travel vouchers. Really, really means is seeking reimbursement for travel that you were not entitled to. We'll come back to the resolution of that in a second. Those were felony counts. And then two counts of abusive official position for misuse of staff related to the Heritage Festival and related to the nannying of your child. Those were misdemeanor counts. This was in total, if I do the math, the potential for 28 years in jail and uh, fines of up to $138,000 that you would have been subject to. You said immediately, I'm not guilty of any of this, correct? Right. Yeah. Months passed during the session and you finally enter a plea on, uh, in June and you plead not just not guilty, but as you said, unequivocally, unequivocally, not, gu unequivocally not, not guilty. Right. Um, now we go ahead a month to June 31st. On June 31st, it's reported that you were offered a deal by the DA to resign office and to take a drug and alcohol assessment, a t drug and alcohol test, and then they would drop everything. And well, you that wasn't the first offer. They, they made four offers. They made four offers prior to that. The one that was reported and the one that it is said you turned down was the July 31st one, and you took particular umbrage, as I understand it, to the suggestion that you should take a drug and alcohol test. Correct. Right. So what were the, so the, the pre, uh, presumably the previous offers made by this DA were not reported. Correct. So did they also involve drug and alcohol testing? Were there other aspects of those offers that you want to share with us now? Nope. There was no drug and alcohol testing. The main thing that was consistent and that the DA's office said was non-negotiable was to resign from office right now. Right, they wanted you out immediately. And that was the condition for dropping the charges. Uh, yeah. Right, so August 1st, you turn the deal down. You say, nope, I'm innocent, I'm gonna go to trial, that's it. Early September, the felony charges are, at the time we believe, mysteriously, we now know what happened, mysteriously set aside for the moment so they can do further investigation. Then on, in early October, one of those felony charges is dropped, and then in late October, all the felony charges are dropped. You agree to pay Seven, a total of $7,000. No, I didn't agree. Well, but as, as, as the deal <laughs> representative, as the deal is reported, the DA says, Representative Dukes, in exchange for dropping the misdemeanor charges, she would pay, it was three dis different amounts, in the, uh, the total about $7,000 in exchange for the misdemeanor charges being dropped. Has that been misreported? has been misreported, yes, just like being guilty was misreported. Well, but Representative, the question here is, did you pay a fine of any size for any purpose to have the misdemeanor charges dropped? There was no restitution in this deal. So you, have, the, you did not pay $7,000? My attorneys paid it because they wanted, they who, said- who, Whose money was it? it? Yours or theirs? Theirs. So your attorneys paid their own money to have your misdemeanor charges settled? They got a lot of money. I okay. paid $138,000. So, so one question I was going to have to, to, to ask you was, did the fact that the misdemeanor charges were settled through the payment of a fine amount to, on your part, acknowledgement of any wrongdoing? No. We wanted to go to trial, okay. and we had the evidence to show it. We, had, we would have won all three cases. We knew from the very beginning that there was no truth to the felonies. They were baseless. They were meritless. They were malicious because they put so much out into the news to just uh, convict me in the court of public opinion and should have used that energy to go and research the statute, research right. the Constitution, research the ethics code, research the uh, rules of the House. And I would not have had to spend $138,000 and 20 months of my life right. fighting to prove my innocence. Yep. In the end, I was innocent, but the machine that works in this county uses media to try cases and to uh, 
change the opinion of people. Unfortunately, I'm just a statistic. I'm not the first African American elected official that this has happened to. I'm the fourth. Well, I want to come back. I want to come to that aspect of it in a second. I do want to go there, but I want to come back to this question of the resolution of the felony counts. So the issue that was was put before all of us was that somehow you had sought reimbursement for travel that you were not entitled to. But it wasn't travel, and that's the biggest part of the problem. Right. It was not travel. It was per diem for doing state business. Right. So they can't even understand that it is not yeah. travel. And there was question about whether you had actually entered the capital or not, right? It's not travel. Un understood. It's doing state work. Well, and, and to understand, yes. you have state agencies. If I went and worked with someone at a state agency in their office, is that not state business? Right. So uh, the statute says that if you attend the funeral, of a former state employee, that's state business. If you fly your plane to go someplace else, even if it's not Austin, that's state business. Right. So where the hell they get the idea you have to be in the Capitol? So I talked to a, 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 a Democratic legislator yesterday, somebody who is a supporter of yours, who told me a story that uh, said this, this legislator said that had gone to Steve Adrian and, go, and, and asked to be reimbursed for um, expenses associated with uh, service in office of a similar kind, not involving going to the Capitol, mm -hmm. and was initially turned down and said, no, that's not the way this works. I'm, I'm entitled to this. And so Steve Adrian said, this is the story that was told to me. Steve Adrian said, okay, let me go back and check this out and came back and said, actually, you're right. You are entitled to it. And this individual was reimbursed for exactly what you were similar to what you had been submitting your reimbursements for. And this happened prior to your, the resolution of your, of your case. So is it possible that they just simply misunderstood, that the DA simply misunderstood, that Mr. Adrian or his staff misunderstood? Is it possible this was just a misunderstanding? You have gone right to this was malicious. This seems to be a confusing question of what the rules permit. It's not confusing to attorneys who read statute. Right. It's not confusing to attorneys who read uh, the Constitution. Article three of the Constitution states that the House and the Senate have certain powers that the court cannot intrude upon. Yeah. Then you go to uh, the House rules uh, because Ethics Commission says when you are dealing with per diem, the House and the Senate have additional rules that they may set. Right. You go to uh, the chapter 52 of the government code, it speaks to state business, but then it says the legislature is exempt from this, 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 and this, right. and they set their own rules. So when you take them all together, because yeah. all lawyers who do law, you know you can't just look at one part of the statute. You have to put them all together. Right. But the bottom line is, number one, the House sets the rules. Number two, the statute says state business is when you're doing state business. And if you can fly your plane anywhere and do state business, then you're certainly not in the Capitol building. You seem clear about this and confident about this. I'm wondering why that this wasn't your immediate response and why it wasn't your lawyer's immediate response to similarly try this in the court of public opinion. Hold up the rule book in January after they indict you on these felony counts and say they're misreading the rule. This is absolutely the way this works. Why, why not fight it at the time? Why would we stand up in the media and express that when I had been doing it all along and it wasn't reported. You think you're not gonna get a fair shake if you talk about it in We public. did not get a fair shake on right. anything. And we knew, and we knew. We yeah. watched things get leaked out into uh, the public arena. Like the thing about drugs, they were so concerned about my child, uh, my young child, and that you know I was on drugs and I needed to go to counseling and be tested. Hogwash. I saw that on social media and come out from a political campaign three weeks prior to the DA telling my attorneys that, oh, constituents are calling and they, they think that we really need to make her resign. When did constituents become a part of the criminal so justice you think system? So you think the DA's office leaked all throughout this case? The to, DA's to... office did leak. Right. And the newspaper kept saying it was from within the courthouse. What we knew in our discussions were we had established um, a, a, little, a little game that we did, my attorneys and I. We would wait, they would go and negotiate, there would be discussions, and everybody on our end was told to go radio silent. And we just counted the number of hours and days yeah. when it got leaked 
and leaked in a twisted manner. Do you think that the DA just blew this case? Have you thought about this? Did they just bungle the case? Is that what happened? You asked the audience or you asked I'm me? asking you. <laughs> well, um, I think they should have done a better job of investigating the rules. So yes. When we went to um, a hearing and the DA was asking for all of the felonies to be set aside so that they could get to the truth, they could do some research because they waited until September the 6th to ever go and interview Steve Adrian. To take, to take the meeting, right, yeah. They, they had never interviewed him yeah. before. I knew that because I spoke to Steve Adrian. Right. I had been speaking to Steve Adrian for 20 months. So then they, And Steve yeah. said they keep misquoting me in the newspaper. So then they blew the case. The DA's office yeah. blew the case. And yeah. their, their so-called evidence was the auditor. The auditor was originally approached by former employee, the sociopath that I fired, and he took all of these things and uh, made up all of these felony and so forth. Right. So the auditor allegedly interviewed Steve Adrian. Under discovery, my attorneys requested right. what he had. He had the cover of the house rules. There was a post-it note on top of it, has Steve Adrian's name, an IRS 160, and a question mark. Now, we had affidavits, and in some cases, we had audio. That's all he had. Yeah. 18 months ago, you did an interview, and that's all you have? I'm sorry, that didn't Well, and the DA, as I, say, as I said at the beginning, the DA now acknowledges that the case never should have been uh, brought. You, you brought up race, uh, the fact that this is not the first time this has happened to an African-American elected official. Others over the course of the 10 months have suggested that there was a racial element to this prosecution. I want to take that seriously, but I want you to show me the receipts. I want you to tell me why you believe this is the case. If this had been Donna Howard as opposed to Donna Dukes, would this have gone differently? She wouldn't have been indicted. They would have talked to her. First of all, if it had been anyone else, knowing that it came from a disgruntled employee, they would have looked at it a little different. They would have wondered, or at least asked, you know, why are you doing this? As hateful as the guy was being. You know, journalistic ethics. I mean, you guys have a code. And in that code, it says that you're supposed to question mm -hmm. what is the motive. No, no one questioned the motive. They just took it at fact. But, which but, but come, back to, and, come back to race, though. I'm trying to understand the, uh, what, about, what, what aspect of this makes you believe that there was somehow a, a poor treatment or mistreatment or unfair treatment on the basis of race. I, I do want to take this seriously, so tell me, tell me why. Because there are multiple individuals that are not my race, that have issues greater reported, you never hear about it, nor does the public, um, their issues are just sitting over at the Ethics Commission have been for years. So this is not the first time I've heard you say this. You believe there are other elected officials who may be subject to similar investigations or indictments who have committed offenses that are as grievous as the ones you were accused of or worse, but they're not being pursued and you were. Far worse, far worse. I mean, I mean um, do you, you, you want to name names, Representative Dukes? Senator Taylor. He had a um, huge amount of uh, reimbursements. You're suggesting that Senator Larry Taylor has an ethics issue. I said he did. He did. And he settled it. No indictment. Um, the senator that was from Hornsby Bend, Frazier, huge. He didn't get indicted, and none of them had more stories written about them than O.J. Simpson, as I did. They had few stories whatsoever. Mine was every week. So you believe you were treated unfairly. And you, and you well, said all along, Representative Dukes, to, to me and to others over the last 10 months that you believe that the news media in particular treated you unfairly, that they got things wrong and got things wrong deliberately. There, absolutely. There was, uh, and I'm going to just say it, American statesmen, American statesmen, every, 
Ryan did a better job at the end. But um, the stories prior, no matter what I said, it was not printed. No matter what I explained, every single article was written more like an opinionated rag magazine, just to paint the story, to build up to pushing the DA to indict. That's malicious. And that was happening constantly. And then other media, instead of doing a little research on their own, would just pick up that story and run with it. Representative Dukes, you've been in office, as I said, for a very long time. You are one of the most senior members of the House. You're elected in 1994. Mm -hmm. You know how this works. If a media is going to write a story, I believe that the media wants to get everything right. They're going to take the most positive view. But I also know that the media is flawed like every other institution, every other individual in the world, and occasionally gets things wrong. If the media prints a story and gets things wrong, what happens is the elected official, say, who was the subject of that story, will often speak to that organization and say, here are the things you got wrong and provide evidence of that. What I found over, I went back and looked at many of the American statesman stories over the last 10 months because I knew you had a particular beef with the statesman. And a lot of times I saw that they tried to talk to you about these matters and you declined. Bull. In fact, at certain points, I'm just saying what they reported. What they reported was that Representative Dukes has not responded to a request from the statesman for some long period of time. I guess my question is, do you feel like you brought your issues with the statesman's co coverage or the coverage, of, not to pick on the statesman, of other media to that media to say to them, you wrote this, this was wrong, here's what's correct? Let me tell you something. One evening, I had company. Um, one of my former employees' mother, who works at a magazine, was interviewing me, and County Commissioner Jeff Trevilian was at my home. My daughter went out to feed her new puppies. It was in August, right after her birthday. She came back in the house to the dining room where the adults were, and she had, was holding up her hand. My daughter usually just runs in and interrupts. She was holding up her hand, so I thought, oh, she's being polite. I'm just finished this conversation. She became agitated. I said, What's up, Layla? She said, there are two men in the backyard dressed like ninjas. They have ropes and they've got a, a banker's bag. And they came up, but I ran in and my puppies are still out there. That happened twice. I had people casing my house. Reporters going to every single Were those statesman reporters? Members. I don't know who Statesman were, reporters are dressing differently than that, in my experience, if that that's the case. Period, yeah. I had to have protection because yeah. there were multiple incidents of attempted break-ins at my home. That's a public record. But all was written about. It seems like anything else right. that's public is written about on me. But not that entire 20 months of hell that my daughter and I went through, which is probably why I had a little emergency last night because of the stress. I guess, I guess I'm, a, I'm just, again, Representative, I'm just asking, did you have had a beef with the American statesman for some time? Did you ever try to correct the American statesman's reporting at any point? I sure did, it started at the very beginning. But you know, after a period of time, Evan, you, yeah. know, you know the saying, you yeah. do something over and over again. And Definition of insanity. Yes, sir. I want to talk about one of the consequences of all this happening playing out over a legislative session. So a lot has been made. Your opponent, your political opponents are making it. Others have brought this up of your absences during this legislative session. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that. I went through the House Journal. I looked at the tallies of the votes. It appears that you were absent for 55 percent of the votes during this legislative session. Some of those were excused, the majority unexcused. You missed votes on SB1, the budget bill, on HB2, the supplemental budget bill, despite the fact you were on appropriations. You missed the vote on the Sanctuary Cities bill, on the omnibus abortion bill. You missed the vote on the CPS reform bill. You missed 75% of appropriations committee hearings. You missed almost 88% of international trade meetings. Okay. I'd like to give but, you an opportunity yeah, to, to, to I, question I those and to, and to respond, up. please, because that, that seems I to really be the biggest issue when to... people challenge whether you've served your district or not. It's the absenteeism. Okay. Uh, first, let me start with all the major bills that you just mentioned, because um, that's the crud that some opponents are putting out. Is it wrong? It is wrong. 
but the House, I went and looked at the House Journal with my you own look, eyes last what night. What you're looking at is the concurrence of the conference committee. That was the concurrence on the last weekend of the legislature. We don't debate the bill then. It's up or down whether or not we're going to agree with the, what the Senate put in the bill. You look at all of those bills, yeah. go back to the second reading, the day those bills were heard, you will see me on the front and the back microphone. Those were concurrences. That's right. crap. But if that's the case, Representative Dukes, why were you in some of those instances the only member of the House to be absent? If it was okay to be absent, why weren't other people absent? Oh, there were plenty of people absent. Not according to the journal. Uh, well, you know, that journal is not correct on a vast majority. So this characterization, uh, this characterization of your presence or absence during the session is inaccurate despite the fact that it's in the House Journal. Look, the House I'm okay, has if, a, if that's your answer, that's fine. I'm just asking. No, I wanna explain it. Yeah. Um, in the House, and everybody knows this, and um, it, it could have been clearly investigated and reported. At 10 o'clock when the legislature goes into session, um, it's generally been that the freshmen would go and they would push everyone's button. You'd be very few people right. on the House floor. Uh, members come in and out, they have meetings, they give speeches, they have other things right. to do. And mostly one has a desk mate and that desk mate or another member close by will vote for them while they're not on the floor. Right. Furthermore, even if you are there and you get up, go to the lounge to eat, or you run back to your office, um, or you take a meeting and you miss a vote, usually someone knows how you're going to vote, and they will vote for you. That didn't happen for me this session. How come? How come? Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, I was at a desk that did not have a desk mate. I was at a desk that was immediately in front of the media, so people, uh, that would have voted for me right. were afraid to do it one in front of the media and there was a concerted effort by my delegation to make me appear more absent than everyone else. Who in your delegation, that's a specific uh, allegation, who in your delegation had it out for you Representative Dukes? Who specifically by name had it out for you? Um, well I've been told by other members of the House um, and as recently as last Wednesday uh, when Garnett Coleman went head to head with one of them, that Donna Howard was the ringleader and Celia Israel followed up. Do you have any evidence of that? Oh, yeah. Are you going to make that evidence available to the press? If you still hate the Not statesman, you can give it to us. That's fine. <laughs> I think in time you'll know, and I think you, uh, it's pretty. I think it's pretty much for me to come out and state it. So, so I went back and looked at the 2015 session. I wondered if the absentee question, that's the questions that came up, might have been specifically related to the stress of the case or the proceedings as they unfolded. I went back and looked in 2015, and in 2015, if I understood this, you missed 84% of votes and 44 of 50 committee meetings. Now, I understand that you had a very serious car accident in 2013. Correct and that you've had health issues related to that car accident that continue to this day. Correct. So should we take from the absences in 2015 and the absences in 2017 that that was medical as opposed to legal as the basis? Were they medical issues? In 2015 and 2017. In other words, I'm looking at 2017's absences and I'm saying, well, you know, she was indicted, said she was innocent the whole time. But is it possible to look at 2017's absences as somehow things got a lot more complicated on the basis of the legal matters? But then I go back to 2015 before the indictments, and what I see in 2015 is a similar pattern. A, a percentage of absences. I'm not going to call it a pattern. A percentage of absences relative to the total number of votes. And I'm left to believe, or to assume at least, that those are health related. All of this is health related. In 2015, February 28th, 2015, I was at the Capitol late one night yes. um, and uh, giving a tour. Yes. People uh, just having fun and horsing around. I had my purse across my, my body. Yes. Uh, and then uh, one of the, the persons horsing around, they grabbed my strap as I was walking and it snapped my neck. I wasn't able to return, but you can see I have a scar here. You do. Which is uh, where the surgeons entered to put in a titanium rod. As well, um, my body was already sufficiently injured 
from the car accident. Yes. Every place that the seat belt touched um, was either torn, cracked, bulged, uh, you name it. But yep. I have fought to keep going. When my neck was severed, uh, having already been weak, I tried to come back to work. I tried to go back to the legislature and I actually did. I went back for the appropriations bill and I was there the whole 16, 17 hours. This is in 2015. In 2015. Right. Um, I came down with pneumonia. An infection entered my spinal cord because it had been cut through and I started getting more sick but didn't know it. And the doctors missed a little MRI in May of 2015. Um, kept going up and down with, uh, with um, health. But then I uh, was on the uprise, changed doctors, changed the team, and I was doing you know, much better. Uh, certainly the stress of the case, and you guys didn't know about the case until much later. I knew about it from January, and I, I knew um, all the, the backstories and uh, the subpoenas that were going in, and uh, because it was a fiduciary crime, right. all of my banks were withdrawing service. All of my credit cards were shutting down. Um, every contract was being pulled because of an error that they made for not investigating. So I was dealing with many, 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 many So you pressures. associate absences with, with this as well, not just health, but also the stress of the case. Well, in February, I'm uh, just going to tell you a story. Okay. In February of 2017, um, Dr. Zarwas noticed that I was starting to walk slow and, and get weak. He and I are very good friends. I'd been his um, vice chair for many years, so he knew me. And we had talked often about my health. And I suddenly started having some kind of strange sensations. Um, and he recommended that I talk to one of my specialists, and I did. We started running tests in early March. Zerwas knew, Sarah Davis knew. Um, we had computers set up in my home so I could interface with the committee, interface with staff, still write the DFPS budget, uh, meet with uh, CPS, DFPS staff at my home, and everyone else because I was connected to these machines. And then um, a diagnosis was made, and it required some major things by, to be paid by the insurance company. And it, like most state employees, the insurance company denied it. So for three weeks, I was continuing to go downhill as uh, I was asking the speaker and others for help to get the insurance paid for it. Finally, they did. Right. And I started a treatment that um, my dear friend, John, uh, helped with. Uh, it was discovered that the damage done to my spine and the infection that got into my spine caused me to have developed multiple sclerosis and myasthenia gravis dually one of only five people in the country. So immediately, we started transfusions, infusions, yep. all types of treatment. The whole time I worked. Many times on the house floor, I was having infusions, but I had it under my jacket. So you think people who just simply say, look at the number of votes she missed, look at the number of meetings she missed, don't know the full story? That, and in 2015, Ruth Jones McClendon was my desk mate. Right. No, let's, uh, I don't know. People here know Ruth Jones McClendon. She had, and a, they she, know, she had a, a brain tumor, did she not? No, it well, was not quite the brain tumor. There were some things, and it, it did affect the brain, but then yeah. eventually um, she had difficulty walking right. and so forth because it was a central nervous system um, disorder. Uh, when Ruth was in uh, 2015, she became very weak. So if I wasn't at the desk, um, and I think at that time Charlie Howard was sitting behind, um, us, Charlie would always catch the button, but Charlie became more busy. Ruth would never team vote. Um, so uh, at that time, it, there wasn't a big deal about going in and making sure that you registered your vote. 
that didn't come up until this year when there was so much outside pressure about you missed yeah. this vote. I guess, I guess the point on all this, Representative Dukes, as we move into the question of your seeking re-election is, does someone who lives in your district, who may have felt that you had represented them and their interests adequately previously, can they look at 2015 and 2017 and feel like we had an active and engaged representative on our behalf in those sessions? That Representative Duke did the representative part of representative democracy. Do they have a reason to doubt whether you were doing your job during those two sessions? They have no reason to doubt whether or not I can represent them or whether I was doing my job. Um, I've never made it a secret that I had an injury. Yeah. Now today is the first time anyone is learning that I have MS and MG dually. But I have fought for my daughter, for my family, and for my district to stand up and continue. Yeah. The reason is because I've been on the Appropriations Committee for 12 years. All of those 12 years, I've been on Article 2 which handles health and human services. Yep. And I have fought for people who have traumatic brain injuries, um, who uh, need assistance, who need health care, um, all of these things that my party yep. claims yep. that it is for. We believe in Family Medical Leave Act, especially for, for families and for um, if you know women often, you know, either pregnant or the caregiver, use it to go and help someone. And right. we say they should not worry that their job is going to be terminated, that they're going to be eliminated if they leave for having a child or an adoption or taking care of, of a, a caregiver. The American Disabilities Act says that if one has a disability, that that employer must make accommodations to assist them. Now, what that act doesn't say but you don't have to do it if it's a legislator. Paul Moreno was in a wheelchair the whole time. So do you think, Robert, ha has the legislature not sufficiently accommodated your disability or your infirmity over the last four years? The legislature has. Yeah. It's the people who try to twist it right. in a different direction. So when, but so, these yeah, same people right. who try to twist it, Evan, yeah, yeah. will give a speech that they support these things for other people. So I, I got an email yesterday from one of the Democrats who has filed against you, filed back before you had announced that, in fact, you were going to seek re-election again. And it is a, I, I called around and talked to people on the campaigns of the other people who are running. And I asked consistently, do you have an issue substantively with Representative Dukes? Has she cast votes that you think are out of sync with the district uh, politically? Um, are, are, do you have an issue with the stuff she's done? Nobody can cite a specific vote or a specific stance. Everybody gets to absenteeism. That's what was brought up. Cheeto Vela, who is one of the Democrats who is running against you, sent out an email to potential supporters yesterday, and here's a quote from that. The simple fact is that the people of House District 46 have been abandoned by Representative Dukes. The record is clear and indisputable. She's not shown up for work. That will be the narrative through line of the campaign against you in both the primary and the general, and your response to that will be what? My response to, to, that? To, to that to that line sounds like a well, sounds like a wannabe, because if he knew the legislature, then he would also know that there was a concerted effort to make sure that only one button wasn't pushed, and I can bring about fifteen right. legislators. And so you intend to you intend to call out the rest of the delegation during well, this election? Since their staff are working on opponents' campaign, that takes yeah. them. Let's cut. Let's come to that in a second. Let me ask you about your health. So the, the I read the quote on uh, the 16th of September when you announced initially that you were not going to uh, serve in another term. You cited your health specifically. Is your health today sufficiently improved to the point that your district, your voters, no longer have anything to worry about in terms of your ability to serve them the way that you suggested in September of 2016 health might be an impediment? Are you healthy enough to serve another term? Absolutely. Okay. I'm healthy enough to serve another term. Um, I have fought back. I have on my high heels. Yeah. Um, I no longer uh, have to use a walker. Right. Uh, that's what these things occur when you change doctors and you get the right diagnosis. Well, let me ask you about that. I know that in the past when people have asked about pain medication, you have gotten unhappy with the question, and I'm going to risk you getting unhappy and taking umbrage with me now. 
Um, you told the American statesman, Tim Eaton of the American statesman, on April 25th of 2015 that you were on heavy medication. There was an Appropriations Committee hearing in March of, tw uh, of 2017, March 29th specifically, that got a lot of notice where you came in late and, and you said, I'm full of morphine. People have a No, I said, I'm coming from the ER. Right, but I'm full of more. But, but <laughs> I yes. said, I, I apologize. You could have been coming Mr. from the Chairman, store, but the important part was the I'm full of morphine. Me, yeah. Like, Donna, stop right. now. So right. I tried to make a joke and right. apologize. So, my, my question is understanding that you've been ill, that you've needed to be treated, you've taken pain medication, dealing with the illnesses and mm -hmm. the infirmities that you've battled since the car accident. Does your district, do your voters have anything to be concerned about as it relates to pain medication or any other aspects of your treatment that might be an impediment to you serving? No. Are you still, on, are you still on pain medication? No, I'm, I have a pain management specialist. I bet you take pain medicine from time to time too and probably everybody in this room. I'm kind of a Christian was, scientist as it relates uh, to this well, myself. Well, you know, good for you. Yeah. Uh, so you're, you're waiting for him to come? Uh, no, I'm just, I, I don't take any medicine. Um, this is a fight with my wife. So. Uh, my doctors were insulted by that statement. Yeah. They text me, they by the, were by, the, irritated by, by, by which statement? By the statement of, uh, I had a drug problem. Uh, my, my surgeons also said, you know, we read the paper, and for them to try and suggest that your car accident didn't cause great injury, you know, it makes us so angry when we know everything that you have been through to get to here again. Yeah. In September of 2016, I didn't know if I would live to January of 2017, but things change. And so your health, the, health has improved? Wrong diagnosis. Wrong diagnosis. So, so then, for the record, you don't have an issue with pain medication. There's nothing that your community, your district, your voters have anything to fear as it relates to that specifically. No, because first of all, uh, when I'm in session and when I'm at work, and my doctor told me this, but I didn't believe it. He said, if you go back, and he was one of many who encouraged me not to resign. If you return, he said, you, your focus will, it's, there's scientific evidence that focus on work reduces your reception to pain. And he was right. Yeah. Because once I went back, um, though one has to go every 30 days to be checked out, yeah. urinate a little cup, so they can check all the medications that you take and how much, uh, and they give you your prescription uh, if it's needed. I didn't have to go for two, two and a half months. Yep. Um, and then when I did go, I didn't need any, anything. Okay. And I realized it actually did okay. take my mind off of those things. My last question to you as it relates to the election is what you alluded to, which is your relationship with the delegation. So I called around and I said, okay, Representative Dukes is now no longer in legal jeopardy. She has announced that she plans to run for re-election. My experience over the time has been that if you have a fellow uh, legislator in your com in your district or in your county in your area and they're of the same party and they ask you to endorse them you endorse them or maybe you would come out and endorse them without them asking mm -hmm. I asked the the other Democrats in Travis County what are you doing about representative Dukes is she going to endorse you or are you going to endorse her in, in the primary I was told by most that they're completely staying out of this race they're not going to endorse an opponent they're not going to endorse you I went and looked at Cheryl Cole, the, one of the candidates running against you in the Democratic primary. Senator Kirk Watson has endorsed Cheryl Cole. Um, there's, been a, there's, for a, long there's a time. timing question also as to whether that endorsement and a number of the other endorsements were made back when the assumption was that you were not running. But Senator Watson has endorsed Cheryl Cole. Congressman Doggett has endorsed Cheryl Cole. Mayor Adler has endorsed Cheryl Cole. No, Adler has not. Adler's on the Cheryl Cole website as of uh, last Adler night at 9 o'clock. Adler told me Saturday. Okay. Well, we have a problem he between the not. website and what he told you, but okay. Four other former mayors have endorsed Cheryl Cole. My question is, how do you get along with the other people in the county? How do you get along with the other people in the delegation to the extent that your effectiveness in the building is not in any way impacted? What happens if you get reelected and you go back into the building? Can you work well with the people who are in the neighboring districts and can you get things done in the legislature? Can you talk about that? I've always been able to get things done in the legislature. Right. As a matter of fact, I've been able to get more things done than most in the delegation, and that's probably why this is going on. 
when you go to the legislature, yeah. you don't go there and say, hey, I'm with this team and just hang out with those folks. No, that was one of the complaints. Donna doesn't hang out with Travis right. County. No, I hang out with everybody in the legislature right. because that, you have to work to get those votes. The Congressional Black Caucus has a saying, you have no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, just permanent issues. And it's those issues that I work on, and I've been very effective in passing and bringing things to fruition, especially for the Department of Family and Protective Services and foster care, yeah. for the Film Commission, writing and uh, creating the incentive program. So you think you, will be, you, you would return to the legislature next time no less effective than you have been in the past, and that the relationships with members of the delegation or anybody else in that building in no way impacts your ability to get things done? There was a concerted effort by the local delegation to prevent my legislation from passing. Uh, that was well known. The vast majority of the legislature, especially in the House, um, are very displeased with what happened. Quite a few elected officials are very displeased. That's why Wilhelmina Delco has endorsed me. Ruth Jones McClendon has endorsed me. Eddie Bernice Johnson, Sheila Jackson, Jackson Lee, Lee right. Al Green, Mark Vize. Gar Garnet Coleman told me yesterday. Every single. He, he's not only supporting you; he's sending you ten thousand dollars, and he'll send you more if you need it. So there are obviously people in the building who are supporting you. And in fact, you know, one of the things I've heard coming back to the question of race as a factor in the last ten months. It's been suggested to me that part of the effort to get you out of office is that the white community wants to tell the black community who should represent them. Do you think there's something to that? I think that there are some consultants. No, let me change that. There are some consultants um, who work to choose the one and some others uh, you know, that want someone that's just going to nod and get along. I'm sorry, but district that I represent does have issues, takes umbrage with some of the things that are presented because District 46, East Austin, has had the majority of the unwanted from this community, whether it was a tank farm or a, tr uh, a trash dump, uh, a rock crushing facility, uh, or uh, a halfway house, you name it. If it wasn't wanted anyplace else, it was placed in East Austin because the city for years had what was called the Negro Code. Now, my district, you know, when, when they talk about highways and roads, uh, asked me to represent them. When I represent them and vote for them, then some in this delegation may be bothered and are bothered. I'm not there to get along just with the delegation. I'm there to get along to make sure my district gets what it needs. Got it. Um, I'm being told that we have run out our string with the Austin Club today, for which I am sorry. Obviously, we started late. Today was not a normal day. We're not going to be able to take questions, Agnes, correct, from the audience. We're just going to need to let you all get to work. I want to thank you all for sticking with us. I want to thank Representative Dukes. Late but here, mark her present. She came and she did this interview as she said she would, and I appreciate that. Give Representative Dukes a hand. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you making time to be here for us. Good. Okay.